I accused Daniel this morning of, of working Dale too hard. He's losing a bunch of weight. And uh, I said, you working your dad too hard? And he said, yeah, something like that. <laughs> so I don't know about that. Anyway, take your Bible to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. If you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able to. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. We'll begin reading verse 11. It says, For this commandment which I command thee this day... It is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life. And that both thou and thy seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life. And the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Look with me back in verse 15, 16. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, and death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. I'd like to preach a message I've titled, We Tend to Drift from the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of the day. We thank you, Lord, for the mercies of the day that we have seen in our own lives. I pray now, Lord, that you would strengthen us to live for you, to serve you. Lord, we have this new day, new week ahead of us, if you so choose to give it to us. Lord, give us liberty and to live for you in great power, to be a witness and testimony for you. And even as we tried to preach this morning, Lord, may we live more and more for your honor and glory. That we might live more and more in such a way that others can see Christ in our lives. But Lord, I pray that we would... Stay on track, not drift. Not allow the world to pull us away and become cold and indifferent. But Lord, I pray that you'd stir our hearts, Lord, stir a fire in our hearts to live for you. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. The Lord asks us to do three things. One, he asks us to love him. The other, he asks us to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments. He desires that in your life. More than anything else, the Lord desires our love and our obedience to follow Him. In December of 1734, the Holy Spirit began to work mightily in uh, Northampton, a congregation led by a 31-year-old pastor by the name of Jonathan Edwards. Most of you have heard of Jonathan Edwards. The sudden death of two young adults led to the turning to God among the young people. And by, and by 1735, the church was filled to capacity. And within six months, 300 people had been saved. As America was swept up in what is known as the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards befriended many of the revival leaders, such as George Whitfield. And eventually, the revival fires died out, though, that they had experienced. But in, the 17, in 1740, revival swept over Edwards' church and congregation once again. Then eventually it died out again. And then 1750, on the heels of the last revival, a group of disgruntled members began to try to get rid of Edwards. 
Though God had used the, this godly man and they tried to get rid of him and, and quench, it quenched the spirit of God in the work that was being done there. They had drifted from the Lord and from his work. You say, what are you, what are you reading that for? Because I want you to understand that it doesn't matter how much on fire you are for the Lord. Doesn't matter how much you walk with the Lord. Doesn't how much you decide that you're going to stay close to the Lord. There's always the possibility of drifting from the Lord. Drifting from His work. You see, many times it's very easy to just come in and, and sit down and, and uh, just uh, uh, go through the motions. And maybe in your, in your daily readings, maybe you just read it, but you don't really try to glean anything from it. You really are not interested in what God is trying to say to your heart. You're just reading because you know that's what you're supposed to do. A lot of people go to church for one reason, because they know that's what they're supposed to do. They don't go to meet with God. They don't go to see what God has for, for them or try to direct their lives. They just go out of mere habit. They have drifted from the Lord. Many stories like, stories like I spoke of here are, can be told about uh, God's people and that have been seen and experienced the great work of the Lord and were on fire for the Lord, yet they begin to drift away and begin to not really live for the Lord like they were living. It's a dangerous thing, and it happens a lot. All across this nation, there are churches that are closing their doors. They used to be on fire for God. They used to, used to have people coming in and people getting saved, and now they don't even have enough to hardly pay the bills and keep the lights on, and they're closing their doors. And, and many of them are closed on, on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and maybe have a little gathering on Sunday, and that's about it. Used to be great moving of God in, in many of these places, and yet they drifted away from the Lord. You see, we all tend to drift and to depart a little bit. And so we've got to be cautious about that. You find here in the Scriptures, it's not that, that we don't know God's commands, but it's that we don't keep God's commands. Look with me here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, and verse, again verse 11 again. It says, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hid from thee. The Word of God is not hid from you. Neither is it far off, otherwise it's not someplace else. It's not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up, uh, go, up for us, uh, uh, go up for us to heaven and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that uh, we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, otherwise it's very close. In thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Notice there that it's not hidden. The Word of God's not hidden from you and me. We have the Word of God. Notice also that it's not far off. Otherwise, it's not like it's in a foreign land or up in heaven or someplace else. It's not in heaven away from us. Notice that it's not across the sea where, where we need to go over there to get it. We have the Word of God. We have God's commands. And we find here that, he knows there in verse 14, he says, But the word is very nigh unto thee. Very close. How close, preacher? Most of you guys holding, sitting in, in, uh, holding on, on your lap right here. But not only that, but it's even in your heart. As God has written in your heart. But what's the problem? Sometimes we walk with the Lord because we're very on fire for God. Wanted God to do great and mighty things. And boy, we was stirred. And man, we was hitting the altar. And we was on fire for God. And now we find ourselves sitting back and just kind of drifting. Just kind of going through the motions. Just kind of going through the ease of it all. We have, good command, we have God's commands. And, and we're not without, so we're not without excuse. Not only to do, do we hear it preached and taught. By mouth, but it's in our hearts. There in verse 14 again, it says, But the word is very nigh thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. God gives you an understanding of his word. A lot of times today, it's not that we don't know what to do. It's that we don't do what we know what to do. And so many times today, we, we, we have a stirring in our hearts to serve God, and yet we sit back and we allow that stirring to grow cold. And dead in our hearts and lives. 
God wants us to be on fire. God wants us to live for him and serve him. Moreover, we have the, the presence of the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us to, to guide us and to empower us and to strengthen us and to help us uh, uh, in every act of obedience to God's Word. You're not without hope. You're not without help. Hey, listen, you have the Word of God in your heart and you have the Holy Spirit that wants to help you to know the Lord and to walk with God each and every day. Preacher, I just don't know what to do. Ask the Holy Spirit. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. Get in the Word of God. He'll show you. He'll open the Word of God to your heart and your mind and cause you to understand what He wants for your life and His desire to do great and mighty things in and through you that we might reach lost souls and might see souls saved and, and see our, our, our families uh, on fire for God, living for the Lord in a great way. You know, the greatest thing that you can have, dads, listen to me, the greatest thing that you can have is a, a, is a light that shines in your family that they can see the Lord working in your heart, Dad. Mm. Dad, listen to me. You're the leader of your house. You need to be the leader that stands up and, and leads a family spiritually and guide and help. We need that in our homes today. There's such a great need in our homes that, that dads will stand up and be that spiritual leader. And it's not that moms can't, but God has placed you in a position that you should. And so we need to grow. We need to walk with God ourselves that we might be that leader. But the problem is, is that we tend to go to broken cisterns. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 says, For my people have committed two evils. He said, my people. That'd be you and me. They've committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. There are two evils which the Lord speaks of here, which is typical of God's people even today. We forsake the fountain of the living water. You say, well, preacher, we're still going to church, yeah, but are you walking with God? Is there a fountain flowing from your life that others can get a, a fresh drink from your life and, and, and it will change their life and refresh them maybe? Your children, your, your neighbors, your co-workers, and, and, and on goes the list. What are they getting out of your life spiritually? What is people, every one of us, what are they getting out of your life? What are they getting out of your life, Cal? What are they getting out of your life, Levi? Hunter, what are they getting out of your life? Blake, what are they getting out of your life? Levi, what are they getting out of your life? Liberty, what are people getting out of your life? You say, preacher, you're talking to these young people, and, and they're not grown yet. No, but they, people should be able to get something out of their life spiritually. Amen. Other teenagers and other young people. And then we come back to us and say, Preacher, what are they getting out of your life? What kind of drink are they getting out of your life? The, the sad part is, is that many of us, uh, the drink that they get out of our lives is nothing more than a, a muddy water from a mud hole with wiggle tails in it. You ever walk up to an old, maybe down by the river or something like that, and you see an old mud hole, and you kind of ripple the water a little bit like that, and I mean there's all kinds of little things going around in there. Sad to say, but sometimes that's what people are getting from our lives as Christians. They need a fountain of fresh water that refreshes them, that strengthens them, not something that's going to, to, to make them sick. They need a fresh drink. We have forsaken the fountain of living water, he said. We, he said, uh, we make a substitute. We, we get a cistern in place of the fountain. God created within us a thirst which could only be satisfied by Jesus Christ himself, who is the living water. Amen. Jesus Christ is the living water. And that, can only, that thirst that we have can only be satisfied by Jesus Christ. Amen. In John chapter 4, verse 14 says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus is that living water. He's that fountain that, that is refreshing to the parched dryness wherever it flows. Without drinking from that flowing fountain, there can be no freshness, no sanct uh, sanctification, no real walk with God. We've got to go to that fountain. You can sit 
You can sit in, in, in Sunday school classes, and if all you're getting in the Sunday school class is, is history and uh, about what took place, and, and you're getting, all you're getting there is, is lectures, can I tell you something? You need something that's got some, some freshness in it. You need to get to the fountain of living water, something that will stir your soul, something that is moving, not something that is just stagnant and, and not moving. Hey, listen, I'm not against facts, but my friend, it takes a lot more than facts to stir the soul. Yeah. <laughs> It takes the Spirit of God. Yeah. Refreshing. That's why your life and my life needs to be that refreshing place, that fountain that's flowing with Jesus Christ so that others can take a drink from our lives, a stirring again. The harsh reality is, is that we've forsaken that flowing fountain. Little by little, drifting away from it. Then we commit the next evil and we make a substitute. We, we move away from the Lord. We, 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 we're not walking with God and we're not having that living water flowing in our lives. So then what we do is we make a substitute for it. And that substitute we find here in Jeremiah 2 and verse 13, For my people have committed two evils, and they have forsaken the fountain of living waters and hewed them out cisterns. But notice why he says broken cisterns that can hold no water. He said, it's, they've moved away from me. They're no longer walking with me in freshness. But what they've done, they've taken and made a substitute. And what they've done in that substitute, they, he said, they've made a cistern. And that cistern is generally what you get runoff waters that go into that. And I understand that in places and, 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 and a, lot of, a lot of times you may not have a well or, or, or anything like that. So they would make cisterns and, and then they would fill it and a lot of that water run off the house and different things of that nature down into that cistern and that's what they had. But he goes on and he says not only do they have cisterns, they made a substitute for the flowing river of water that was there available, which is Jesus Christ. They've made a substitute and he goes on, he said, not only have they substituted with a different type of water source, he said, but that cistern is cracked. It doesn't hold any water. So where are they? Dryness. Deadness. They've drifted away. And many times we, in our lives, what we do is we know that there's something missing in our lives because there's a thirst. But we substitute the stagnant cistern water for the fresh fountain of God. If you was to go out here and go, I could take you, I don't know any place around here, I'm sure there are places that's got springs. I can take you down to southeast Missouri in, in, in multiple places where there is springs running, fresh water. And you can just reach down and cup your hand and cup that water and take a drink of it. It's fresh, it's cold, it's coming out of a spring. And it's, it's, it's warm. You can see it's clear. Or I can take you over close to where it's at over there and there's a, a mud hole. And if I was to take you there and I say, okay, uh, uh, why don't you drink out of that mud hole? You say, why should I drink out of the mud hole when I've got a spring to drink out of? Well, the question is spiritually, why should you drink out of a mud hole or out of a broken cistern when you have the living spring, which is Jesus Christ dwelling within you? Why should we be that way? Why should we make a substitution for something that is available to us? The availability of, of that flowing river of water is within us. That fountain flowing and it should be in our hearts. You know what? There ought to be a fountain flowing in your life. Amen. Years ago, my grandparents owned a farm down there in southeast Missouri. And, and um, I remember the spring that was there. It was a pretty good little sized spring. It probably about, about from here to that wall over there. And back out to about that, uh, the third row there, and all the way up here probably to, to pass this uh, modesty wall. And the spring was there, and that water was flowing out of there constantly. There was mint growing in it. And man, I tell you what, it was nice. It was nice. You say, you remember that far back? Yeah, I was a kid, but I still remember it. Amen? And that water was fresh and you could just cup it and it was cold and you could get a fresh drink and it was clear and clean. Well, they sold that farm. And later on when I was in my late teens, I went with my grandfather out there to visit those people. We knew them they, over the years and everything and went back out there and, 
And I said, I want to go down and look at a spring. He said, well, there's not much of a spring anymore. And I got down there and looked, and the cattle had tramped it down so much that all there was was wet mud. And they had sealed off that spring by tramping it down and beating it down. Was the spring still there? The spring still there. But it had been sealed up by misuse. Can I tell you something, folks? The spring's still there. But sometimes we seal it up by misuse. Because we don't keep it cleaned out. Because we don't keep the sin confessed. Because we neglect it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Oh my soul, how we ought to realize that there's a spring within us. If you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, that is, is welling up, that wants to come forth and give people a fresh drink of Jesus Christ through your life. The sad fact is, is that we make substitutions then. We make the substitutions when we let it gets sealed up and there's something missing in our spiritual lives and we know that it's not right. And so we begin to make substitutions. We pray but not from the heart. We speak of Christ, but not with passion. We serve, but not with love and desire. We attend, but we only do it out of duty. We do programs that replace the power of God. These and other things may offer temporary comfort and pleasure, but only the water from the fountain of God can sustain and satisfy your soul. Oh, how we got to get back. And too often we've drifted. And preacher, where does it start at? It starts with our love. It starts with our love. If you're sitting here tonight and your heart is not on fire for God like it ought to be, can I tell you something without hurting your feelings? It's a love problem. You don't love God like you ought to. People don't like that, but that, that, there's no other way to put it. Because if you love him as you ought to love him, you won't let anything get between you and him. You won't, you won't let the abuses happen to, the, to that fountain there. In Revelations, and we go here quite often, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and thou have, how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience for my name's sake, and hast labored and hast not faded. Man, he gives them a great commendation. He said, man, you're doing a great job. You're working hard. You're doing all these things. But the next verse says, But I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Do you know what they've done? They have forsaken the fountain of living water and they have hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They've made a substitution. They're still going through the process. They're still talking spiritual. They're still, I, I, I run across people continually who they, they, they talk the talk but there's no walk with the walk. It doesn't come together. They say one thing, but their life shows something different. And what it is, is that they've hewn out sisters. They've made a substitution. They know what they should have. The Lord said, I'll, I'll have no graven images made of me. That we should put no graven images. And you find the children of Israel as they come out. And as God calls Moses up on the mount to, to give him the, the commands of God. And, and then when he goes back down and there's the, the excitement going on in the camp. And Joshua said, it sounds like war. He says, not war. Got down there and they had made golden calves. And Aaron told him, said, this is your God that delivered you out of, out of Egypt. Now they were still thinking about the God that delivered them. But they had made a substitute. A substitute. You find over when God split the kingdoms. And how that uh, the king of, uh, of Israel, because he was afraid that people would go back to Judah and go back to Jerusalem and worship. So what he did, he made a substitute altar. And it caused the people to sin. A great wickedness. 
And every, as you go through there, you find all the kings, pretty well all the kings in Israel from that point on were wicked and vile. What happened? They made a substitute. They drifted from the living God. They were still making offerings. Still had the priests, still going through the, through the processes, but they had made a substitute. Well, he tells them here, and, and he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And then he says, Therefore, remember from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and re will remove the can thy candlestick excuse me, out of his place, except thou repent. The church of Ephesus had all the works down, but their works were substitutes for the love of God. Can I tell you something? You can run a bus route. You can be a preacher. You can be a Sunday school teacher. You can be a deacon. You can be active going out, doing things with the church and all that sort of stuff. And not walk with God. That can become a substitute. You see, those things should come out of your love and your walk with God. But many people try to use that as their walk with God. You got it backwards. And so you begin to drift away. You're making substitutes. And the Lord says, be careful about that. He said, you, you'll wind up uh, 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 living away from me and, and not having the blessings of God, but the cursings of God on your life. We don't want to admit it, that we've got a love problem sometimes, yet the Lord says so. He tells us in John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. In 1 John 5, 2 and 3, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. It may not be that which we are doing that is wrong. But maybe that which we are supposed to be doing that we don't do. Because of our love. Many struggle with obeying the word of God and it's a love problem. If there's an area that you won't surrender your life to the Lord in, it's a love problem. We find that in Galatians 5, 16 says, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not. And there again, notice there again in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 16 says, In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. He said, walk in the way. Love him. Can I ask you? You say, well, preacher, I love the Lord. Do you love him more than you love yourself? Do you love him more than you love your money? Do you love him more than you love your things? Do you love him more than, and we could just keep on going with the list of things? He's to have first place. He said that he is to be preeminent. That means before first place. It's not first place. It's before first place. He's to be preeminent in our lives. So we find that we are to love him. You see what we're needing, and what a lot of Christians are needing in this day and time, is a fresh encounter with the Lord in our lives. A refreshing over the years, I've heard it called a lot of things. Coming back to the Lord. Rededicating my life. Getting things right. Getting closer. Whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, can I tell you that we need a fresh encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives? It is a stirring again, a refreshing, a moving closer to God. You say, preacher, how often does that need to happen? Continually. Continually. How often do you go get a fresh drink of water? Daily. We need that. That encounter with the Lord and to walk with Him in freshness. But we may go weeks and, and months and sometimes years without that close encounter with the Lord and, and walking with Him. The Lord told the church of Ephesus, remember, He said, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and then he says, and do the first works. Otherwise, get back in fellowship. Get a heart for God again. Get a stirring in your soul. 
Hey, listen, I'll tell you something. Teachers, bus workers, preacher, all of us, we need that stirring, that encounter that, that stirs our heart, that excites our soul. It's not just going through and doing this and doing that. My friend, you can, anybody can go through the, 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 the facts and go through the things uh, and, and teach lessons and all that. It ought to come alive in our lives. You're, in, in your Sunday school classes, teachers, hey, listen, it ought to be alive. It ought to be exciting. It ought to be stirring. And it ought to be because you're walking with God and, and people are, are tuned in and, and watching and listening because they see that you're excited about it and you've got a fresh drink and they want what you've got. Amen. We need that. Without that, all we do is cause people to use a substitute. We need a freshness. We need to fall in love again with the Lord anew and afresh and seek Him with all of our heart. St. Chronicles 7, 14, he says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways... Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He said, then. But we've got to come back to that place. We begin to drift. Say, preacher, who's drifting? All of us. We all drift. I don't know if you've ever drove a boat. But the waves begin to move you. And you may be going down river or out on a lake and you're going to a certain place and you've got to continually correct it. Continually correct it. Why? Because you drift. You drift. You drift. If you go down, you say, well, preacher, let's just go with the flow. We used to take teenagers, when I was a youth pastor, we used to take teenagers canoeing every year. We'd take them canoeing. It was a three-ring circus. <laughs> Many times the girls, they get in the boats and they go like this. From one side to the other. One side to the other. And they was always arguing. The front one, it was their fault. Or the one in the back paddling, it was their fault. And, and uh, it was both their faults. Amen. And the guys would do the same thing sometimes. And people say, well, just get in there and just go with the current. You wind up under a root wad too. I remember one time the girls was out and they was fighting it back and forth, got into the swift water and everything, and I heard a bunch of hollering and screaming, and we come around the bend, and there was a big old root wad, and it was washed out probably about uh, six, eight foot deep under that root wad, and girls were standing over here, and there was this canoe stuck down underneath that root wad just like that. <laughs> they had went with the current. Can I tell you, if you don't correct it, you wind up under a root wad. Our lives have to continually be corrected because we drift this way or we drift that way. And we've got to line our lives back up continually with the Lord. Satan is continually trying to, to get us under a root water, get us up on a, on a bank somewhere. He's trying to stop us from living for the Lord. Can I ask you tonight, are you just going through the motions in the areas of your Christian walk? Get real honest with, with yourself. You're not saying anything to me. You're not saying anything to the person next to you. But can I ask you something? Where's your spiritual life at tonight? Are you just going through the motions because you know that's what you're supposed to do? Have you made you a substitute, really? And you're not really walking close to God? In the areas of your Christian walk, hey, listen, are you just going through those motions? Then you've probably made some substitutes along the way. You're not drinking from that fountain continually as you once did. And if you're not drinking from that fountain, you've, maybe you've tromped down that flowing fountain that should flow from your life to your children, to your co-workers, to the rest of your family, to your neighbors, to those at Walmart, the gas station, wherever you're at. There should be a flowing that people can see a difference in your life. And it should give them a fresh drink. And it should stir them. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God. And he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. He said, draw nigh. Get those things taken care of. Get back. And begin to follow the Lord. Maybe tonight, 
you're sitting here. It's not that you've went off way out in sin and done a bunch of stuff, but you've drifted. Can I tell you, this preacher has to keep pulling it back in line. I drift. We all drift. We've got to keep pulling it back in line. If you just let it keep going, before long you begin to make substitutes. Before long you'll be drinking out of a broken cistern. Before long, there'll not be the freshness about the things of God. It won't stir your heart anymore. You, you, instead of getting excited about God, you'll get mad and aggravated about everything that's going on. You ever been there? Oh, yeah, we all have. Nothing's right. We need to get back. Back in that channel where there's that freshness. Preacher, how hard is it to get that fresh encounter? Just get on your face before God. Get on your knees before God. And He's ready to clean out the debris and cause that fountain to flow again in your heart and life. Oh, He wants it to flow fresh and powerful because it brings honor and glory to His name. Let's bow. Father, we thank You. We love You. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with us now. Help us to glorify you. Help us to magnify you. Lord, it is so easy to drift. Lord, I know that in my own life. And Lord, I know that I've got to constantly bring it back into position. It would be easy to drift and just take it easy. But Lord, a flowing fountain is not something that just takes it easy, but it pushes through the rocks and pushes through the dirt and cuts away. Lord, and it's powerful. Lord, I think of some of the mighty springs, big springs over Van Buren and Current River and all those, Lord, that the, a mighty spring pouring out thousands of gallons of water. Lord, I pray that our lives would be like that, that there would be a freshness pouring out floods. Lord, that others could get a fresh strength, that it would be a blessing and encouragement. Help there be an excitement again in our hearts and lives. And help us, Lord, to, to fall in love again, freshly with you each and every day. Have your will and way, Lord, in the invitation. Lord, I pray that you speak to hearts. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you for us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?